Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming so early, and I, all, I hope that you all have a great summit. So today, I'm very excited to talk about some work we have done at, Berk, at Databricks over the past year, helping healthcare and life science organizations to improve our lives. Now, as you've already heard in many talks during the summit, Databricks Unified Analytics Platforms enables data engineers and data scientists to do their work faster and better than ever before, even do things they couldn't do before. However, as our platform usage in organization is growing, we are seeing more and more people who are not data scientists, who are not data engineering, engineers wanting to use our platform. And these are domain experts such as bioinformaticians, social scientists, mechanical engineers, product managers, and many more. And we are very excited about this trend. Why? Because these domain experts are in the best positions to understand the business challenges of their organizations, and they are in the best positions to maximize the value out of their data. However, there is a gap between these users and our platform. And this gap stems primarily from the fact that these domain experts have limited knowledge when it comes to data science and data engineering. But we want to change that. We want to empower all of these domain experts to use our platform to solve their problems. And to do that, we need to bridge that gap. And to bridge that gap, we need to develop domain-specific and industry-specific tools. And the first industry for which we are doing this is healthcare and life sciences. So today, I am proud to announce the preview of our unified analytics platform for genomics, the first of its kind. Next, I am going to talk about some challenges and present some solutions that our, for, that, that our platform provides to address these challenges. Today, we are seeing massive investment in genomics data. And many of the world leaders are here in UK. So why is that? Well, it turns out that genomics data is at the heart of the health science and healthcare revolution. By combining genomics data with claim data and with clinical data, domain experts hope to achieve faster drug discovery by identifying the mutation in the DNA which causes a particular disease. They hope to reduce the health claims by diagnosing and even treating diseases before they manifest, and to provide better patients' outcomes by providing personalized, personalized treatment for every individual. The volumes of genomic data is exploding. It is predicted that by 2025, the amount of genomics data we are going to generate is going to be 20 times larger than the entire video, video we are going to upload to YouTube. And this explosion is fueled in big part by the dramatic decrease in the cost of sequencing the DNA. It took 13 years and it cost 2.7 billion 15 years ago to sequence the first human genome. Fast forward, and today, to sequence a human genome takes less than three days and it costs less than $1,000 by using spe specialized sequencing machines. However, to get value out of this all genomics data is hard. One challenge is that the volumes of genomics data we are generating increases faster than our computing capabilities. This is exacerbated by the fact that the Moore's law, as you all know, is coming to an end. So what does this mean? So well, this means that the cost of processing all the DNA we are going to sequence in a, in a year is going to grow exponentially year over year from now on. Furthermore, the existing tools to process this data are brittle and primitive. First, before you analyze the data, you need to prepare the data. And to do so today, 
you need to stitch together up to 10 disparate tools to build complex pipelines of up to 40 stages. This is expensive, time-consuming, and unnecessary delays downstream analytics. Second, once you have the, or prepare the data, you need to analyze it. The tools to analyze today this kind of data are hard to use and do not scale well. Many of these tools still provide command line interface. They are not flexible. They don't provide machine learning capabilities. And many of them, they are still running on a single node. So basically, it's infeasible to process petabytes of data in a timely manner. And finally, the disjointed nature of today's tools forces clinicians, computation biologists, and bioinformaticians all to work separately in their own silos. As you can imagine, this dramatically hurts their productivity. Over the past year, we have worked closely with some of our customers and partners to develop solutions to some of these challenges. First, we are providing with pre-built, optimally configured pipelines. So this means that instead spending time and money to manually build these kind of complex pipelines, you can start and run one of these pipelines by just clicking the button. Furthermore, we leverage Apache Spark and we add genomic-specific optimizations to significantly improve the speed of the existing tools. For example, today, using a state-of-the-art tool, it takes two and a half hours to process a genome. With Databricks, Unified Analytics Platform, it takes less than 40 minutes. So this is up to almost a 4x improvement in performance. Second, once you prepare the data, we provide powerful tertiary analytics tools, which allow the users to interactively query the data at scale, use sophisticated machine learning, algorithms and models to faster and better, to get faster and better insights. One of the early users of these analytics tools is Regeneron. Regeneron is a leader in genomics. This year alone, they are going to sequence 300,000 genomes, the most of any organization in the world. Before Databricks, it took them 30 minutes to run queries on a 60 billion genome association dataset. With Databricks, today it takes them three seconds. This is 600 times faster, or almost one, three order of magnitude. This is massive. Finally, we provide a unified collaborative workspace, which enables all these users to collaborate and interact in real time, to share artifacts, to share the results. This leads to dramatically improving their productivity. And this collaborative workspace is used today by quite a few of our customers. And one example is Sanford Health, where a team led by Lynn Carmichael is using Databricks to dramatically accelerate turning the clinical research into clinically validated screens. So to wrap up, today we are announcing the preview of the United Analytics Platform for Genomics. This platform includes a highly optimized best practice pipelines, a powerful tertiary analytics with machine learning capabilities, and a unified collaborative workspace. All these platforms run on Apache Spark. And by providing genomic-specific optimizations, we are able to increase the performance as compared to existing tools by orders of magnitude. So please, if you are interested, sign up for the preview, play with it, give us feedback, help us to improve it. So, by unifying these capabilities in a single platform, we are enabling healthcare and life science organizations 
to accelerate the discovery of drugs, treatment, and improve the delivery of patients' care in one word to improve our lives. I, we, we are inspired. We are very excited about this effort. And I hope that you are as well. I also hope that some of you will join us in this effort. So now, in order to demonstrate some of the capabilities of our platform, please welcome Frank Northstaff. Frank is a lead of GTM, GTM lead of healthcare and life sciences at Databricks. Thanks, Frank. Thank you very much. All right, well, good morning, all. Good morning, all. So, uh, very glad to be talking with you all today. So I'll, I'll go ahead and take a walk through to demonstrate how a customer of ours like Sanford Health might use the Databricks Unified Analytics platform to go ahead and train some models that can allow them to predict you know, whether you have a risk for developing a disease that has known genomic risk factors. So uh, as, as all of us, you know, all of us in this room, I assume, have gone to a doctor, and we're, we're all probably pretty familiar with the typical, you know, the typical diagnosis and treatment pipeline, where, you know, I'll come in with a set of symptoms. I'll, I'll say, you know, doctor, I'm not feeling well. I have, you know, a headache, a runny nose, et cetera. The doctor will work through the symptoms that I, say, that I have. He'll go ahead and diagnose me with the disease, and then he'll recommend a treatment that, you know, that I can go ahead and, you know, I can take to go ahead and make me well again. But the problem with this is it's actually a very reactive and costly process. You know, if, if we look at many of the diseases that we have, you know, ultimately, you know, these, these long diseases, uh, you know, things like diabetes, things like heart disease, we can, you know, we can identify risk factors for them early. We can get into, uh, you know, into predictive treatment uh, regimes that will prevent us from developing the disease after all. And this is a very large problem right now. You know, if we, if we look at, uh, you know, at kind of health trends right now, you know, if we look at a person in, uh, in the EU, you know, by, a, by the age of 15, they're likely to have a chronic disease by, uh, you know, 30% uh, chance of having a chronic disease developed by age 15. These are, di you know, diseases like diabetes or you know, uh, some sort of a heart ailment that, th that will go ahead and stick with them for a long point in their life. And so ultimately, you know, a lot of people are looking at going ahead and changing this. How can we, how can we get ahead of these trends? What can, we, what can we do differently so that people aren't stuck with these lifelong diseases? And one of the big ways that people are trying to look at this is to say, hey, you know, we know, you know, we know that a lot of these diseases have some sort of hereditary factor. You know, if, if my, you know, if my family has a, you know, if multiple people in my family have cancer, I'm likely to get cancer. If multiple people in my family have heart disease, I too am likely to develop heart disease. So can we go ahead and identify those risks and get patients into treatment early? And, um, you know, ultimately what it goes from is, you know, instead of having that, you know, that long cycle where I present with symptoms, the doctor diagnoses me and gets me into treatment, we want to move to a, to a regime where we're doing, you know, you know we, we want to predict the risk that I will get the disease and go ahead and take measures to prevent it before those symptoms arise. And ultimately, you know, we, we want to do this so that we can accelerate the treatment process. We want to improve outcomes. We want to, you know, we don't want to think about, you know, how do I make your diabetes symptoms better? We want to think, how do I prevent you from getting diabetes in the first place? And ultimately, this is a really large opportunity to use genomics. So, you know, we talk about our, you know, the work that we're doing with Sanford Health. And they're, you know, what they're trying to do is they're trying to run a large population scale study, you know, collect, collect genomic data from 150,000 people and turn this into recommendations that, you know, a primary care doctor can go ahead, you know, get that genomic data from a patient when they come in and use that to guide their care. But as, you know, as we talk through this, this whole process is very complex. I have to take in this, you know, this data set. It's going to be many terabytes of data. I have to process it in a process that you know, right now might take weeks to months. Ultimately, I have to develop a model that I can then go ahead and apply. And you know, this is just like any other machine learning model. I have to come up with a way to get into production. And ultimately, I have to take this, this long, complex pipeline and generate reports that, you know, someone who's not a layperson, you know, a doctor is definitely not a layperson, but they're not, a, they're not necessarily going to be very computationally sophisticated. So we need to generate this report in a way that they can interpret it. So let's go ahead and look at how we can go ahead and do this using the Databricks Unified Analytics Platform for Genomics. Excellent. So, so what we'll go ahead and do is this is a use case where we'll run through using the HALE tool, which is bundled into the Unified Analytics Platform for Genomics, to run an association study and generate a, a risk model across all the, you know, all the genomic variants that you have. If I were to do this today, 
I would have to take in this, you know, I would have to take in these large scale data sets. I have to run a quality control process to make sure that I'm, you know, going to train my models on data that is good, data that isn't misleading. I have to run this large genome wide association study. You can think I'm going to train, I'm going to train about, you know, 90, 90 billion or, you know, about 90 million to up to, you know, up to 150 million linear regression models in parallel. So good, good application for Spark. I have to evaluate that model. I, I run this loop where I'm going back and forth. And then ultimately I have to apply this to a patient. And if I did this today on a single node, many of these steps are designed to run on a single, you know, single node. I would have to manually paralyze it. This whole process could take weeks to run. And what we've done with customers is we've actually taken this process, we've run it on the UK Biobank data set, and we've gotten this runtime down to about two hours. What it winds up looking like in this notebook is I'll go ahead and I'll import the hail tool. I'll uh, go ahead and read in my genotype data along with my phenotypes. So genotypes are the genetic data that you have, and uh, phenotypes are, you know, the traits that we want to study. So in this case, you know, what we've done is we've generated a data set that has, uh, that has estimated data for your BMI, so your body mass index, kind of a relative measure of your, your weight relative to your height, along with uh, status of, uh, you know, your diabetes status. And here's, you know, really quickly we can pull up a visualization of your BMI, and we can see it's roughly normally distributed. So, you know, higher BMI means that you're, you know, typically heavier. Lower BMI would mean that you're lower weight. Average is about 25. The first thing that we have to do is, you know, as, as I mentioned, we want to run this quality control process so that we are, we're going to fit our data on, uh, you know, on, on data that won't mislead us. And one of the big problems that we get is as we look at these large populations, there are many variants that are not common in a population. And, you know, we think about a disease like diabetes. Diabetes is a fairly common disease. It shows up in about 10% of people. So we don't want to look at variants that show up in 1% of people. They're unlikely to be, you know, they're unlikely to be causative for diabetes. Um, this plot here that I've generated goes ahead and plots that. So this plots, you know, the, per you know, the percentage of people with a, uh, you know, with a specific variant. As you can see, you know, we have uh, about 90% of the variants that we look at are, you know, less than 5%, like in less than 5% of the population. So we can go ahead and filter these out so that we're, you know, we're able to go ahead and, and work with a common variance. And, and running this query on top of a large data set is pretty expensive. When I go ahead and I run it here, I'm able to run this in seconds. I'm able to do this in interactively. I'm able to run this quality control process in an interactive and an iterative way, as opposed to waiting for hours and then having to kick off a new run. When I then go ahead and run, you know, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll train these many linear regressions in parallel. And what I'm able to go ahead and pull up here is, is a plot that demonstrates which positions in the genome are likely to strongly correlate with BMI. What's interesting with this is we, uh, you know, we're working on a public data set that doesn't actually include the BMI, you know, your BMI value. So we generated this, we generated this data by simulating, uh, simulating it from certain, certain genomic variants that have been studied by, you know, studied by scientists that have been determined to have a correlation. What we're able to do is we're able to recapitulate that correlation and, you know, we can see, okay, you know, the, the, the data points that we thought that, you know, that we know, that we know drive this BMI trait, yes, you know, we can see that they have this strong association. What we're then able to do, we've also gone ahead in parallel and run this association against diabetes. And one of the things that's very interesting that we can look at here, so this, you know, this axis is telling us, you know, the strength of the association of a single genetic variant with, uh, you know, with BMI. So as you go to the right here, that means that this variant is more likely to drive, you know, a change in your BMI. As we go from top to bottom, or from bottom to top here, we're looking at the strength of a variant against uh, your status for diabetes. So variants that are up at the top were, are more likely to, you know, more likely to affect whether or not you will have diabetes. Uh, as we can see, you know, there's a pretty, there's a pretty strong, you know, kind of linear, uh, linear thing here, which makes sense. You know, we know that, that diabetes is, is um, you know, mediated by your body weight, your fat content, and we can see that a lot of these variants that have, you know, that strongly influence your BMI also strongly influence your, uh, your diabetes status. But interestingly enough, we can also pick up a number of variants over here that, you know, that go ahead and uh, mediate your diabetes status without having a strong effect on your BMI. And, you know, we can hypothesize that maybe these are related to, you know, pathways of how you process and metabolize blood, uh, you know, uh, sugar in your blood, insulin, and so on. What we then need to do, you know, typically the way that we would go ahead and assemble this risk model is we, we would sum across all of, you know, we would essentially combine all of, these, all of these linear regression models that we've trained in parallel into one model that we can then apply. And the simplest way that we can do this is by aggregating together. 
And so what I now have is I have, I have this risk score that I've generated across the whole genome along, and here I'm plotting the actual BMI that, that we've seen. And one of the things that's kind of disappointing when I've gone ahead and I've, I've, I've done, this, done this plot is I would like to see a strong, you know, strong linear association. You know, I would like to see that low risk equals low BMI, high risk equals high BMI. But one of the things that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not seeing that here. And ultimately, though, what I can start to do is I can start to tweak with some of the knobs that I have. You know, I can get back to that iterative loop where I'm going ahead and refining my model, and I can go ahead and find out that, hey, you know, some of these variants that are down here that are weakly, that are weakly associative, if I include them, they actually corrupt my risk model. So as I go ahead and I run a filter, I can go ahead and, and get, you know, I can throw out these points and I can start to get to a risk model that has a, you know, that has more of a strong association where I have kind of a strong linear component to this association between risk, this risk score that I predict, and this BMI. And now that I've generated this, you know, I have a number of different things that I can do. I can, I can pull this into the Spark.ml library. I can, I can use machine learning to go ahead and tune this model to be a bit better. I can take that model export and apply it on data that we've gone ahead and processed through the, D uh, through the DNA seq pipeline that we've built in. But ultimately, I've been able to do this in a very highly productive, very efficient manner where instead of taking weeks to go ahead and do this, I'm able to run these iterative parts of my analysis in seconds to minutes. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, you know, again, we're, we're in preview, so if you're interested in preview, uh, previewing our platform, you know, please sign up for our preview. And thank you all very much for your time.